it is 8:30 and everybody is here. We've done our sound checks, so I'm going to I'm going to kick us off. So good morning to everybody who's listening. My name is Jessica Holmes and I'm currently serving as the interim chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. Today's day 5 of our uh, hospital budget review process, so we're going to be hearing from North Country and Gifford today. Just as a reminder to arrive at decisions for every hospital, we look to our statute, we look to our hospital budget rule for guiding principles. Um, we have to balance several competing factors. On the one hand, we need to work to slow the growth in healthcare expenditures. On the other hand, we need to ensure that our hospitals have the resources that they need to recruit and retain healthcare workers and to provide the care that we expect in our communities, high quality care. So as we attempt to balance that cost containment, access, quality, and, and health system sustainability, we have to be mindful of this year's significant headwinds. We have historically high inflation rates, we have workforce shortages, we have provider burnout, and we're still facing the impacts of COVID-19 um, at all of our institutions. And we've been hearing a lot about that through all the budget hearings that we've had so far. So both nationally and in Vermont, we know that hospitals are facing unprecedented financial challenges as our businesses, families, and, business, and individuals. So over the next few weeks, the board is going to be working to approve uh, fiscal year 23 hospital budgets for the 14 community hospitals that we regulate. But I just want to remind everybody who is online today that the board is working very closely with the Agency of Human Services to begin the work that's outlined in Act 167, which really aims to move us closer to a sustainable hospital system that ensures that Vermonters have access to high quality, affordable care. That work is going to involve extensive data analysis and community hospital engagement. But the hope is that the end result is a more sustainable path forward. So as we turn back to the hearing today, I just want to extend a thank you to both North Country team and the Gifford team for the time and effort that they've taken to submit the documents for our review. We know it takes a lot of time and we appreciate the effort there to help us understand your budgets. There's a few housekeeping notes about the hearings today. Uh, this presentation is a public meeting. It's being recorded and transcribed, so there will be a publicly available record. If at any time a hospital's leadership team believes there's some confidential information that the Green Mountain Care Board should consider, either as part of your presentation or in response to board or staff questions, just let us know. Because if needed, we can go into an executive session and review confidential information from hospitals. Executive sessions would be limited in scope as uh, defined by the open meeting law and limited to information such as contracts and information that would be considered confidential under the Public Records Act. So if an issue of possible confidentiality arises, I will call on our legal counsel to determine the scope of what could be discussed in that executive session. And then if, if it's deemed appropriate and at the appropriate time, I'll just ask a board member for a motion to go into executive session. All right, well, then it looks like everybody is here and everybody's audio works and our court reporter is transcribing. So uh, good afternoon, Gifford. Uh, welcome to our day five afternoon of hospital budget hearings. Before we begin, and I'm going to turn it over to you in a quick second, um, I'm going to ask Russ McCracken to just uh, swear in anyone planning on speaking at all today, either presenting or answering questions. If Russ, you could do that for us. Great. Yeah, thanks, Chair Holmes. Um, <clears throat> for the Gifford team, anybody who is uh, planning on speaking or presenting today, uh, if you could raise your right hand and I will swear you in. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. I do. I do. I do. Great. Um, thank you. You're sworn in. I'll turn it back to you, <clears throat> Chair Holmes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And it looks like you have your, your presentation. We can see it. So feel free, Dan, to take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much and a good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity today to discuss Gifford Medical Center and our fiscal year 2023 budget. Um, I'm Dan Bennett. I'm the, um, I'm the CEO at Gifford and I'm joined today uh, in presentation roles uh, by our chief financial officer, uh, Jen Bertrand, uh, and also by our the vice chair of our board of trustees, Vic Roboto. Uh, Rebecca O'Berry, Gifford's Vice President of Operations, and Jill Markowski, our Vice President of Nursing, are also here and uh, maybe helping us out uh, as we get into the question portion uh, of the 
of the uh, of the hearing. So I want to start today um, uh, in talking about the current state of healthcare as it relates to Gifford. Next slide, thank you. Like all of Vermont's hospitals, a Gifford Medical Center faces a difficult reality. Uh, first and foremost, we're experiencing widespread workforce challenges. Uh, during fiscal year 2022, we significantly increased our reliance on traveling staff uh, due to numerous vacancies in nursing, uh, radiology, and lab positions. Uh, we also experienced difficulty in other non-clinical uh, positions including environmental services, nutrition services, accounting and other business functions. And it wasn't uh, possible and it's not possible to obtain temporary staffing in many of these non-clinical areas. So in those areas, unlike the clinical areas where we have travelers, uh, we're forced to spread the work amongst fewer people. During this past fiscal year in 2022, uh, we've taken numerous steps in response to these workforce challenges. Uh, we've enacted an organization-wide market-based compensation analysis. The result of that uh, were wage increases for staff at Gifford that totaled over a million dollars. Uh, we also established a $15 an hour minimum wage for Gifford employees. And uh, both of these moves ref were reflective of the wage inflation that we've seen in the economy. We've also continued uh, with uh, numerous activities that emphasize Gifford's positive organizational culture. Uh, some of these include uh, having Gifford's behavioral health team providing in-house support for employees. And this is in addition to our regular uh, employee assistance program. Uh, for many years, uh, Gifford has offered a child care program uh, and in recent years uh, specifically for children of our employees. Uh, this is something that we continue to do. It's a tremendous benefit uh, to our employees and uh, one that does uh, require a subsidy uh, from Gifford. I said for many years, uh, just on a personal note, uh, my son's in his mid twenties and uh, he went to that uh, many, many years ago. So it's uh, definitely something that's ingrained in the, in the Gifford culture. Uh, we've also, um, uh, one of the things we've learned in the pandemic is the value of remote work where that's applicable and we have uh, in a number of areas expanded remote work activities uh, for our staff. Uh, we also uh, this year reinstated a temporary uh, wellness time off benefit uh, that we first initiated as part of our employee pandemic support response uh, in 2021 and we did it again uh, this year. Uh, we also created some additional employee recognition programs uh, this year. And we continue to invest in training programs both in-house here at Gifford and also with uh, our area educational partners such as Vermont Technical College, Norwich University, Randolph Technical Career Center, and Stafford Technical Center. Uh, from these efforts and others, we have seen some success in retaining and recruiting staff. Uh, including in our support services areas and also with new graduate hires in, in nursing. And our expectation is that we will be able to reduce some of our traveler usage in fiscal year 2023. But I want to be clear that this uh, does remain a significant risk. As you've heard from other hospitals in, in your hearings the last couple of weeks, uh, Gifford also experiences uh, barriers to providing access at the appropriate level of care. We continue to see extended wait times for patients in our emergency department seeking mental health treatment. But I do want to pause for a minute here and say thanks to uh, Vermont's Agency of Human Services, uh, who has begun providing some Medicaid funding uh, while we have patients who are awaiting placement for mental health treatment. So thank them. Uh, I want to thank them for doing that. But the um, the conclusion here uh, in uh, current state is that after two and a half years of a global pandemic and at a time when we are seeing troubling increases in verbal and physical violence against healthcare workers, coupled with high rates of inflation, lack of housing and childcare services, among other issues, uh, our healthcare workers are stressed and they're stretched. Next slide, please. So you've already heard a few of the uh, concerns and risks uh, in, the, in the previous slide. 
um, all of these issues, all these risks uh, impact the sustainability of uh, our healthcare system here in Vermont. Uh, at Gifford, uh, something that is both a risk and an opportunity is our electronic health record implementation project. Uh, and we anticipate that we'll be able to go live with our new electronic health record system in July of 2023. We expect to derive tremendous benefit from this project, including significant upgrade in our capacity to support our population health activities, efficiency gains by different system users. Uh, those users now will be able to access patient information from one system as opposed to multiple and also increased access to clinical, operational, and financial analytical tools. However, we are taking this project on at a time when our system is strained and our resources are reduced. And I won't repeat the workforce challenges that I noted in the previous section, but that obviously uh, is a huge risk, uh, not only to this project, but in general. It's also taking longer to, than usual to recruit providers uh, as it is with uh, other staff members. Uh, this is also a situation that's uh, worsened by the lack of available housing for people who want to move uh, to our area and to Vermont uh, in general. Gifford has also deferred investments in our physical plant and it's imper imperative that we maintain an operating margin that's sufficient for us to be able to address not only our facility, but also our equipment and our technology needs. And like everybody else, we've also felt the impacts of inflation and supply chain disruptions. Next slide, please. Gifford is focused on advancing our population health strategies. We embrace the philosophy that our mission includes providing care when people need it, and engaging our community members to improve overall population health, which will reduce the need for more costly healthcare interventions over time. Our status as a federally qualified health center and a critical access hospital provides a unique opportunity for us to accomplish our population health strategies. To that end, we've invested resources in psychiatry and counseling services, community-wide dental programs, and support for transportation and food security programs. Our chronic disease management programs include our diabetes clinic that is making a significant difference in people's lives through individualized programs and coordination with multiple providers. Gifford has championed food security initiatives in our communities. In addition to participating with the Vermont Food Bank, uh, along with other hospitals in the Veggie Van Gogh program. We also provide food drops in harder to reach towns throughout our service area. By partnering with individuals and organizations in these towns, we ensure that people who lack transportation or are homebound also have access to healthy food. As I noted uh, earlier, our planned investment in a new integrated electronic health record system will advance our population health capabilities significantly. Next, I'm going to turn uh, the mic over to Gifford Medical Center Board of Trustees Vice Chair Vic Robato, and he's going to discuss our strategic planning process and our governing practices. Next slide, please, and then over to you, Vic. Thank you, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vic Robato, and um, I'm happy to participate here in the hearing today, give a perspective from the Gifford Board. Uh, first of all, I just want to note that we take strategic planning seriously, that uh, we know that the environment is constantly changing and that we need to adapt to remain effective. Every three years, we set aside time to take stock of the issues impacting the people we serve and how well Gifford is positioned to meet these challenges. The board, medical staff, and management work together to establish priority goals to become accomplished over the forthcoming three-year plan period. We undertook that process in 2021 for the present uh, 2022 to 24 plan uh, period. So this slide uh, describes the priorities, kind of boiled it down to one page, a lot of work to one page, uh, that resulted from the process. And we've titled them <clears throat> as uh, people and culture, population health, 
infrastructure, and governance. Under each title, you see our primary goal and key objectives. What you don't see is a list of, I don't know, 50 or 60 tasks and projects uh, that are tracked and uh, progress is reported to the board on a quarterly basis. So under, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, each of these four priority areas. Uh, people and culture, it's about investing in our workforce. They are at the heart of what we do and we can do nothing without them. So we're focused on recruitment, retention, training and development and uh, developing staff to grow with us. In population health, we recognize that our mission is not only to treat illness and injury, but to help people improve their health status and avoid acute illness. That takes engaging with the community and moving our processes and systems more directly in line with, with that approach. Uh, infrastructure, we're installing the analytical capabilities to better support operational and clinical decision making, as well as creating master facility and technology plans. And then governance. Uh, these are indeed challenging times, and the board is focused on Gifford's financial stability. Therefore, good governance has to be a priority. Uh, to be sure, we are focused on the, to be sure that we are focused on the right issues that we hold management accountable, that we represent the community's best interests, that we formally evaluate our own performance as a board each year and always seek to do better. And we view these four priorities as, as mutually supportive of each other. Next slide, please. So here's some tangible examples of what we mean by exhibiting good governance. Uh, we do provide oversight via several standing committees, such as finance, quality, personnel, and compensation. They meet regularly. Uh, we engage with management in meaningful conversations, and we get our questions answered. We review strategic plan progress, as I mentioned before, uh, at the board meetings. We know that the healthcare system in Vermont is in trouble. Uh, Gifford will continue to work with our state governmental agencies and other providers to seek solutions that address the needs of our communities. And finally, we are committed to uh, providing access to important clinical services and to making sure that Gifford is sustainable and will be there over the long term. That is what our communities expect of their board and their institution. Next slide, please. We get feedback from our community in a variety of ways. Uh, this includes the community health needs assessment, patient satisfaction surveys, community representation on the board, and just conversations on the sidewalk with friends and neighbors. But a survey only gives you so much, and we are going out to hear the voice of the community in a more structured way, not just assume we know what they think. So this year we add what we call the listening tour to our means of getting community feedback. This is something we had planned to do several years ago, but were delayed by the pandemic. We arranged uh, these structured meetings open to the public in Rochester, where I live, Bethel, Randolph, and Chelsea. Board management and medical staff leaders visited with community members to hear their concerns directly and their ideas about health care and well-being in the community. It was very informative um, and uh, a wonderful experience, quite honestly. The general themes we heard include issues around access to various types of care, uh, things that are listed here, transportation, medication affordability, food insecurity. In some cases, Gifford can address these issues directly, like in uh, addiction medicine services that we provide. And in other situations, we work with partner organizations like the Food Bank to produce the monthly free food distribution Stan mentioned earlier. So we're very pleased with the way these community conversations have been going and look forward to continuing them. Uh, now I'll turn it back over to Dan. Thank you, Vic. Gifford has uh, a unique uh, organizational structure and I thought it'd be worthwhile to spend a couple of minutes uh, reviewing that with you today. We're one of only two organizations uh, in the country uh, where a federally qualified health center, uh, or a FQHC, is the parent organization for a hospital. In our case, there's a second subsidiary corporation as well, Gifford Retirement Community. Uh, and they're represented on this chart that's on the, on the screen. 
FQHCs are regulated on the federal level by HRSA. Um, at our uh, board meetings, we fine people a dollar if they don't um, spell out the acronyms, but I'm going to assume that you know who HRSA is, um, but I can, I can spell it out if you want. Um, uh, and like with uh, other hospitals, uh, uh, like with hospitals, the regulatory environment for FQHCs can be complicated. One key regulatory principle for FQHCs, um, and I want to note that I'm um, greatly simplifying this for brevity, um, but one key regulatory principle is that FQHCs cannot be owned or controlled by another organization, such as a hospital, and our structure reflects that requirement. Gifford Medical Center is the largest uh, component of our organization in terms of revenue, expense, and the number of employees. And the budget and other financial information that we present to the board uh, is solely for the hospital, Gifford Medical Center. In terms of our financial reporting structure, we have several divisions under Gifford Medical Center, including obviously the hospital departments uh, with all the clinical and direct support um, uh, departments in there. Uh, our child care center, which is called the Robin's Nest, and our administrative and support services that so uh, that serve the entirety of Gifford's uh, programs. Uh, these Gifford shared services are allocated out to our three corporations, utilizing appropriate accounting practices. Uh, next slide, please. Next, I want to show you uh, some examples of what resides in the hospital and then what resides uh, within the uh, FQHC. Um, uh, at the hospital, that includes all of our inpatient medical surgical care. Uh, as you know, we're a 25 bed uh, critical access hospital. Our surgical and specialty care practices are located within the hospital structure, uh, and you'll see some examples of those specialties uh, here under the second bullet in green. Um, these services that fall within Gifford Medical Center. All of our ancillary services fall within the hospital, including our laboratory and our radiology services, among others. The hospital contains our 24-7 emergency department, our uh, operating room, our surgical services, uh, and our renowned uh, birthing center. Uh, it also includes our rehab services, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech, uh, they also fall within the hospital structure. Next slide, please. So on the screen now are the services that are contained within our federally qualified health center, Gifford Healthcare. Uh, it contains all of our primary care services, and those are located across six sites. Uh, that includes our family internal medicine practices, pediatrics, behavioral health, uh, it does include our OBGYN and midwifery practice. As I noted, the birthing center itself is within the hospital, uh, but the practice and the providers um, who practice there uh, are included under the federally qualified health center. That is something that's uh, probably quite different from what you see usually uh, on, the, on the board. Uh, it also, uh, as Vic noted, we have a number of other programs, our addiction medicine program. Uh, we contract out with another nonprofit uh, to provide mobile dental care in the area, uh, and uh, nutritional counseling and other services are also, uh, also fall within the FQHC. So I hope this was helpful uh, to give you a little bit more information uh, on what's in the hospital, what's in the FQHC. I know it does get a little bit um, uh, convoluted with us because we are a little bit different. Um, we kind of like being different, but um, it is good to explain that sometimes uh, for, for people. Um, and uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to, uh, to Jen Bertrand. She's going to take you through the next several slides. Jen, next slide, please. Thank you, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jen Bertrand. I'm the Chief Financial Officer here at Gifford. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank the board. We do recognize that this is not an easy budget cycle for any of us, and uh, it's good to see you. It's been a while. Uh, I also want to take a moment to, you know, really thank and acknowledge Sarah and the staff. We know that there is a considerable amount of work that goes into this process, and it is not unnoticed. And we really appreciate the, you know, partnership with Sarah and the team. And with that, we'll dive into the financial portion of our presentation. 
So normally we don't lead the financial section of our presentation with our margin discussion. However, you know, in recognition that it does stand out and also, you know, dovetails quite nicely off of Dan's last few slides, I did uh, figure we should start here. And noticeably, our margin does appear quite favorable. However, as Dan mentioned, our corporate and divisional structure is truly a factor when evaluating our margin. We've really extended the services under the Gifford Healthcare umbrella beyond what a, a basic footprint would be for a small healthcare organization. So as an example, not many critical access hospitals have an on-site daycare for its employees, and that is subsidized. Um, but it is really critical for us in terms of recruitment and retention efforts in our area, especially when childcare resources here are very scarce. Also, most FQHCs, as Dan mentioned, do not incorporate the professional side of obstetrics and gynecology into its footprint, even though it is allowed under an FQHC structure. So I just want to be clear there, it's not a normal footprint that you would see. And it is one that does tend to require a subsidy, especially in the case of our current situation where we are shouldering a, a larger subsidy, honestly, as we've experienced some considerable provider vacancies for this particular service line. And normally those locum expenses um, would be recognized in the hospital, but because of our structure, they are being incurred by the FQHC instead. So in turn, that would have had an impact on our margin and bringing that margin to a, a more reduced standpoint. Our nursing home, of course, is an extension of our hospital. And if you've heard other hospitals mention, we certainly have a systemic issue with the availability of skilled nursing beds. Our nursing home actually consistently runs at a 98% capacity on average. But again, this service does operate at a significant subsidy as well. But all of these much needed services are truly essential you know, to our community but again, they do rely on that subsidization from our anchor, which is the hospital. So as a result, the hospital's margin is diminished after we account for the support that we do provide for those services. And just to touch on one other thing as we're on this slide, you know, as Dan mentioned in FY23, we will be implementing a new EMR. This did require us to scale back investments and in capital, you know, this is going to have a considerable impact as with any implementation on cash flow. So we need to be responsible. So our budgeted margin and day's cash position is going to allow us to really reserve for that future impact of the EMR implementation. And inherently with any EMR implementation, there is a delay in receipts that's going to require us to dip in what I call dipping into our savings, so to speak, um, in order to float that difference in the cash flow. So it is going to be a, a bit significant. You know, we're probably looking at the duration of about six months for Gifford for the longer lasting impacts of that um, implementation and delayed receipts. Next slide, please. As it pertains to net revenue and our fixed perspective payments, our budget is yielding a 7% increase when it's compared to the FY22 budget. And a portion of that net revenue increase is attributed to some volume increases that we've been seeing in various outpatient service lines. But also one item I wanna mention that's certainly having an impact on our net revenue is related to one of the accounting changes that's involving our contractual allowances and the reclassification of those adjustments, which is contributing to the increase in NPR. And I'll talk about that a bit further in the next few slides, but I just wanted to acknowledge that is creating a swing. We've also incorporated an estimate <clears throat> excuse me, for our Medicare cost report settlement. And that is taking into account the increases in budgeted expenses, as well as the budgeted cost report settlement factors that we're going to see inherent to another accounting change with the creation of a management contract methodology. And I'll touch on that in a couple of slides as well. Uh, I do want to mention that we feel Gifford is in compliance with GMCB's budget guidelines. It does fall below the two-year cap of the 8.6%. 
Uh, so I did want to mention that. And then also just mention from a fixed perspective payment standpoint, our FY23 budget does include our participation in Medicaid and MVP as we continue that participation. We have been participating in those two payers here for quite some time. So we are going to continue that participation. And if you could go to the next slide, I'll talk about the future state of where we might go with this. Um, so obviously we're going to consider future participation in Medicare as well as the Blue Cross program and any commercial other commercial programs after we've been able to implement and stabilize the new EMR. And as Dan said, again, that's slated for July of 23. So some of the things that we've been doing in terms of our investments in healthcare reform, um, we have listed here on the slide, but it is important to note that those investments that we do have listed in the narrative, as well as what you see in front of you right here on the slide, they're actually included in our FQHC's budget. Um, but certainly to be transparent, the investments that we've made recently under um, the FQHC do primarily fall into these three areas. So behavioral health care coordination and diabetes management. And frankly, those investments have largely involved the hiring of additional staff to support the ongoing work in those three particular areas. So I did want to mention that about what our investments are in, in health care reform. Next slide, please. So I'm going to spend a little time on our commercial rate increase. Our budget does incorporate a 3.65% rate increase at the aggregate level. We applied a 3% increase to our inpatient charges, a 3.28% increase to our outpatient charges, and a 15% increase for our professional charges. And the marginal rate increase that we are proposing is really going to cover the commercial portion of inflation and some of the cost shift factors. And we've really tried to outline the methodology of how we arrived at the rate increase in this bottom section that you see here in the slide. And I'll walk you through that. So on the left-hand side, we have a calculated inflationary impact of 931,000 that we've incorporated into the budget. That's then translated to a calculation of the commercial components that constitute the rate we've incorporated. So then on the right hand side there, we first apply the commercial mix of unique patients, which in our case, you can see at that top section is 34%. That comprises 316,000 of the uh, 679,000 that we're requesting. We then layer on the historical impact of our um, annual payer policy changes, which for Gifford has historically been about $70,000 annually. We do calculate a cost shift factor for Medicare. Now keep in mind, the only applicable cost shift impact is related to the clinical, not the administrative, but the clinical portion of provider salaries, uh, fringe, as well as benefits. The rest is mostly, and I'm gonna say that on purpose, mostly covered uh, under our cost-based reimbursement methodology. And then lastly, the calculation and the applicable uh, Medicaid cost shift amount, that is again based on our Medicaid mix. And so all of those components comprise the $679,000 that we're proposing for our modest rate increase. And you're gonna hear me say this again, and I'll talk a little bit further about this in our expenses, that we have not passed along the wage inflation that we did incur in FY22. You know, we, we recognize that the 3.65% does stand out, but we were really trying to ensure we minimize the impact on our community and, and maintain a level of affordability for our patients that we do serve here in our HSA. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna spend a little time because um, for this year's accounting changes, we have quite a few, we have four to be exact. The first accounting change that we have listed here on the slide is really pertaining to our uh, professional anesthesia services. We did transition this to a purchase service model. So essentially, this is going to reduce our net revenue um, for those professional services on the NPR line, but essentially increase the expenses pertaining to the contracted professional services. 
The second accounting change that we have listed is really related to what you heard me mention before, our adoption of a management contract methodology. And we did this at the beginning of FY22. Um, and we really like the use of management contracts is really a way of discreetly identifying all the administrative and overhead expenses that are allocated to all of the divisions under the corporate umbrella. And Dan alluded to that earlier when we refer to that as Gifford Shared Services. Historically, though, those expenses have actually been embedded in the individual expense lines, and that includes salaries um, when you look at the face of the hospital's financial statements. So the reduction in the overall expenses is really primarily related to that particular adjustment. And you know now we're doing that appropriate allocation and recognition of those expenses between the divisions. And it's also um, a component of that reduction leads me into the next point of one of our accounting changes, which applies to our daycare operations. Historically, the expenses and other revenue associated with this particular division have been included in the reporting of the hospital's budget. But as Dan mentioned, you know, we made the decision to break this out as its own division. So that did result in us removing all of the associated expenses as well as the other revenues for that particular service line from the hospital's reporting. So this did increase uh, the margin when you compare that to prior years. But again, it is important to mention that it is a subsidized program and you know it does support our recruitment and retention efforts we did just make the decision to break that out as its own division and then lastly at the end of um, fy 2021 we did conduct a very thorough assessment of our current uh, revenue cycle processes so that we could identify areas of improvement and one of those specific areas was the classification of our contractual adjustments between payers. We had several factors that were contributing to our need to make this correction. And I'll give you a few examples. One is, you know, we had payer classes that were not designated to the correct patient location. We did have some adjustments that were not classified um, based on how payers reimburse. We did not have distinct breakouts for workers comp or Medicare Advantage. Those did not exist in our system. Um, they do now. And then our general ledger structure, it didn't support the needed uh, distinction by payer and patient location. And then another example is we had a lot of, actually all of our adjustment codes, they were hitting one corporation um, instead of being designated to the appropriate corporation. Um, so therefore, we did find it crucial to make these necessary changes to correct the contractual structure. Next slide, please, Penny. Just to touch on other operating and non-operating revenue, I want to take a moment and talk about 340B. So obviously, as some hospitals are mentioning, you know, 340B funding does continue to be an area of concern and risk. Now, I want to point out that the majority of our 340B funding is actually recognized under the FQHC. So therefore, on the face of the financial statements, the hospital's funding does look very minimal because the majority of it is in the FQHC. But I did want to say that, you know, originally um, the FQHC was actually exempted when all the manufacturers were actually um, going through their process and not granting that 340B funding. However, um, in the last several, well, it's been almost a year now, um, the FQHC is now being negatively impacted by that as well. So, you know, we are actively trying to explore some of uh, available alternative solutions to the reduction. We're gonna work with, and we've already reached out and have been working with, I should say, um, our third party administrator, as well as some of our FQHC partners so that we could try to find a solution for that funding. Another item to mention when it comes to other operating revenue, the budget does assume a decrease and that um, when you compare that to the prior year's budget. And again, that is related to the daycare revenue. Daycare revenue is, is recognized in other revenue. So I did just want to mention that. And then lastly, our budgeted uh, 2023 non-operating revenue, I'll admit that is an identified risk. Um, market returns, as we know, 
They're unpredictable. We did assume a gain for the budget. So obviously our total margin would be negatively impacted if we weren't able to recognize those gains. So I did want to uh, acknowledge that. Next slide, please. So candidly, we've got a bit of minutia occurring with our expenses as we've implemented some best practices in accounting and overall our uh, expenses are decreasing when you compare them to the 22 budget as well as our 22 projection. The two primary contributing factors were the ones I've already mentioned. It's the change in the management contracts as well as the daycare expenses. Um, but also, you know, in reducing costs, we've really focused on cost saving initiatives in our organization. And we've really tried to challenge ourselves. We know this becomes more and more difficult, but we're really trying to challenge ourselves and our staff, you know, to find offsetting savings, especially in consideration of the fact that we're going to incur the expense of operating two EMR solutions in this next fiscal year. So we needed to be very uh, cognizant of our expense growth in this year's uh, budget. Some of those cost saving initiatives that we have incorporated um, are continuing to improve on our uh, staffing control process. That way we're limiting FTE growth within our organization. We're also going to be integrating uh, staff benchmarking into our process, that same process. We've certainly continued our efforts when it comes to um, our agreements with service contracts and purchase service agreements. You know, we're constantly trying to reduce costs there. We were able to achieve some savings with some recent changes that we've done to our contracted arrangement for professional anesthesia services. So when, when we first entered into this contract, um, the provider complement was 100% MD. And in partnership with our vendor, we were able to shift a good portion of those positions through attrition to CRNAs, which do come at a much lower expense. And the other piece of that with our contracted negotiation um, with our regional third party for this particular service, we've been able to mitigate the utilization of locums to cover any planned or unplanned time off, which we weren't able to do in the past. So that's another area. You know, we're certainly challenging ourselves and trying to find cost saving initiatives. We engage our teams and our staff and really try to encourage them to be part of the process where they feel that they have, you know, ownership. They're able to accept ownership of this and be part of the process and really be financial stewards in, within the organization. And I did want to touch on uh, some of the other challenges, though, because we realize that our budget is reflecting a decrease in expense because of all the things that I was just mentioning, but we're certainly feeling the same impacts as other hospitals when it comes to the unprecedented workforce challenges. And like most, both in our state as well as nationally, our recruitment and retention efforts are being challenged constantly by, you know, the inflationary pressures, wage compression, workforce availability, it's constant. And it really does continue to impact that balance that we try to st strike between financial viability and adequately supporting the needs of our workforce. You know, we're, as Dan mentioned, we're really feeling the impacts of staffing vacancies. And again, not only in clinical areas, but in support areas. And as Dan mentioned, we just don't have the temporary labor options to fill those positions. And they're critical, especially in environmental services and our dietary positions. You know, it is systemic. We're feeling this throughout the organization. We've got vacancies in billing, coding, patient access, I'll be honest with you, as I sat into other hearings and it was interesting to hear another hospital have the same issue that we do in accounting. We've had a vacancy in our department for nearly a year at this point. Um, so it is systemic. It's not just in one particular area. And then, of course, the increases in labor expense in order for us to keep pace with the market right now, they're just significant. Um, and as Dan mentioned, for the hospital alone, we did invest over a million dollars in FY22 toward permanent market uh, adjustments that we did for our staff, and that wasn't budgeted. 
We did increase our minimum wage here to $15 an hour. Again, that was not budgeted. And we really tried to be responsible and we absorbed those unbudgeted wage increases and we did not carry them forward into our 23 wage inflation that we did use to substantiate our rate proposal. We did absorb that. But like everyone, we're continuing to feel the pressure. You know, we're getting competition from retailers, the restaurant industry, and they just continue to keep ratcheting up that $15 floor. And it's it's crazy because we're competing for the same workforce. And I don't really like to use this term that much, but it really is true. We're, we're really battling wage war and we're not just doing it with each other. We're doing, doing this with other industries and it's really impactful. And I do just want to mention that we acknowledge that we do have some risks in our budget. And especially when it comes to the potential for another COVID surge, we did not incorporate any COVID related impacts into our budget. You know, there's also risk in budgeting a minimal amount for travelers, which is what we did for 23. Obviously, it's with the hope that we can counteract that reliance that we needed in, in fiscal year 22 with the recent increases in our wages. That's our hope. Um, and lastly, with the modest wage increase that we did build into the budget, there does continue to be a significant risk with the uh, market pressure for wages. And I did just want to acknowledge that. Next slide, please. So you heard me mention this earlier, but as a result of our EMR implementation and our consolidated operating margin performance, we've really limited our capital spending to approximately 100% of depreciation, which is really resulting in a target spend of about 3.9 million for our capital budget in fiscal year 23. And obviously I wanna acknowledge and we recognize that that's not a long-term solution, especially with our age of plant, which is exceeding 16 years. Um, frankly, we recognize that we've been caught in this perpetual deferral cycle, so to speak, because since the onset of COVID, we're, you know, we've really deferred about yeah, it's north of $6 million in capital investments. So that is certainly not a sustainable model, but our goal post implementation and stabilization of our EMR is really to achieve a reinvestment of about 120 to 140% of depreciation. Next slide, please. Uh, the board had requested as part of our presentation process to just speak to the supplemental data monitor monitoring. So I just want to briefly touch on the three areas of focus um, and refer anyone to our submitted response, you know, for any further thoughts and details. But as it pertains to the market share report, we did feel that when it came to evaluating net revenue, it does omit certain components that we did list in our response. But overall, we did not feel that there were any material fluctuations in net revenue when we were evaluating that report. And then with regard to the uh, reimbursement analysis, admittedly, we felt a little bit hampered by not having some of that detailed supporting information for the summary data um, so that we could further understand the analysis with regard to that particular um, report. And lastly, as it relates to the demographic report, we do incorporate the demographic and population characteristics of RHSA into our budget process, more so independently of the report, but inherently we do incorporate those factors into our budget process. And before I hand it back to Dan, you know, I did just want to say that we feel the budget we're proposing is thoughtful it's responsible and it does remain in compliance with the guidelines that the board has set forth. And with that, I will hand it back to Dan. All right, thank you, Jen. Sorry, I've got to reshuffle my screen here. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, speak to our health equity um, efforts here at Gifford. Um, one of the things that um, that I find um, very redeeming about um, working in Vermont's healthcare sector is the way that uh, people are willing to work together to solve problems. 
think we all saw that was evident throughout the pandemic. Um, and it's also true with uh, all the efforts that people are making around uh, to advance health equity in the state. Gifford's a small, uh, small nonprofit healthcare organization uh, that has far more priorities uh, than resources available to, to accomplish the priorities. So we need to rely on our partners as, as they rely on us uh, to both share information and resources. Uh, and many other, uh, several other organizations around the state have offered assistance uh, with health equity efforts, uh, including UVM Health Network, uh, Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Centers, Health Systems, I should know that, uh, and uh, by state uh, primary care association. And, uh, and, and we have been able to utilize some of those resources and benefit uh, from them. Uh, we do have in, uh, an internal uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion group uh, at Gifford, uh, and that includes members from across our organization, uh, providers, staff members, uh, our leadership, and human resource teams. Um, uh, admittedly, our process has been methodical, and at times uh, our progress has been um, impacted by uh, our internal staffing resources. Uh, our team has uh, selected a number of uh, initial uh, priority areas for focus and have uh, begun working on them. Uh, these include steps to ensure that our environment and our surroundings will be inclusive and welcome uh, to all. Uh, our team is developing organization-wide training on uh, DEI. Uh, that This uh, will include individualized trainings to particular departments, but we'll also utilize our organizational education uh, employee education platform to ensure that we do have standardized training uh, that all employees um, will receive. Uh, our program is still in the early phases uh, and we are working to create a process within our organization that we can then adapt moving forward as needs arise uh, throughout our organization. Uh, next slide please. Uh, so uh, the board did ask us as well to um, provide some data on uh, wait times and uh, visit lag, and we have provided that. Uh, some general comments. Um, obviously, our goal is always to provide care uh, at the time and the uh, place of service that is um, needed by the patients. And many factors uh, do include uh, uh, do influence uh, wait time. Uh, these include the availability of providers and other staff, uh, patient choice and preference. Um, one thing that uh, we try to do at Gifford is if in particular, um, for instance, with primary care, if somebody calls uh, for an acute visit uh, and they call a particular practice or looking for a particular provider, if uh, we're not able to get them in in the time frame they're looking for, we will offer them another location uh, and or another provider uh, where they can receive that service. But sometimes they choose to wait. Uh, sometimes uh, they choose uh, to uh, to go to a different to um, uh, an urgent care or another uh, setting as well. But that does impact wait times. Our imaging numbers are impacted as well by the, the purpose for which a test is, order, is ordered. Uh, for instance, uh, if a test is uh, ordered to support a new patient appointment, so a person is going to a new provider and needs uh, an imaging uh, test uh, for that appointment, uh, they'll usually get that test just before uh, their first appointment. So if their appointment with the provider uh, has a weight to it, then their imaging test will is also. Um, I'd want to point out that there is no weight uh, for acute imaging needs uh, for services included in this reporting. Um, uh, if somebody is coming to our emergency department or if a uh, practice calls and says somebody needs to get in uh, urgently, emergently, um, we get them in and they get done and there is no, uh, there is no weight for that. Uh, next slide, please. So it, it feels a little bit uh, disconcerting two and a half years in to still be talking about the impacts of COVID, um, but it is still relevant. Um, uh, we we did include that in our narrative. You see it here on the on the slide. 
um, and they speak to some of the impacts as well as some of the things that we've learned over the last two and a half years. Um, but the impact of COVID really is, uh, is, is long reaching in how it's affected our workforce. Um, and it's really difficult to express the stresses our staff have been under. And um, I'm not just speaking to Gifford, obviously this is the situation everywhere. Um, so not only the stresses they've been under, but also the sacrifices uh, they've made. Uh, ultimately, our, our budget presentation is focused on uh, what we need to do in order to care for our communities, both in the traditional sense and also in the terms of the work that's required to fully implement a healthcare system based on population health improvement. But none of that is possible without a well-supported workforce. Uh, and as I noted earlier, uh, uh, our healthcare workers are struggling uh, and this is a very difficult time uh, for them. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So uh, closing remarks. Um, again, our purpose today was to provide you with a greater context uh, to the many activities that our fiscal year 2023 budget supports while highlighting many ways that Gifford supports its communities and also is guided by our communities in all that we do. As Jen noted, our budget meets the guidelines set by the board uh, and we ask your support in approving. Um, uh, we have uh, included an appendix um, and um, uh, that <laughs> includes our income statement, our, our balance sheet, and our cash flow statements. Um, and we uh, haven't, um, uh, we're not gonna go over in detail on those, but obviously we can answer any questions you have about them. Um, but I wanna thank you again uh, for your time and your efforts in this process. Um, and uh, repeat something uh, Jen said, it is nice to see you all again. We took uh, full advantage of the opportunity you provided last year for uh, hospitals that um, fully um, met your guidance uh, to uh, not do a, a public hearing. Um, that was not uh, uh, an indication of our not wanting to do it, but uh, uh, was something that we did take advantage of. And uh, it's nice uh, to be back here in front of you and uh, we'll turn it back over to you and uh, for your questions. Well, thank you, Dan and team. Uh, it is nice to see you all back. Um, hopefully at some point we'll get in person again but appreciate that both last year and this year that you submitted budgets that were within our guidelines. So I just wanna note that we really do acknowledge and see that and appreciate it. Um, so at this point, actually, I'm just gonna take, we're gonna take a 10 minute recess. We've been doing this just to give board members a chance to compile their thoughts and also people to stretch and take eye breaks. So we'll come back at 2.35 and we'll start uh, in with some board questions, so. I will see you all in about 10 minutes and thank you so much. I think we have everybody and the court reporter is always here whenever I ask. So I'm just <laughs> gonna assume there, see there's the laugh. <laughs> the laugh of, of being here. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, I am here. <laughs> all right, great. Okay, well with that, um, thank you for the great presentation again, Gifford, Gifford very clear and thorough. Um, I'm gonna kick it over to board member Lunch. Thank you, and it's good to see you both. Um, I'm sorry, I'm glad you were not, you didn't have to come last year, but we always like to see your smiling faces nonetheless. Um, and thank you for submitting a very responsible budget. Um, it's much appreciated. I had just a couple of small questions. I'll note that uh, Jen, you anticipated a couple of my questions probably from having heard them earlier, so I don't need to ask them again, and I appreciate that. Um, and so one follow up on the EMR implementation. I know um, you spoke to making some assumptions um, when you were looking at your margin in terms of the revenue issues that come with EMR implementation. Did you also include assumptions on utilization specifically in your request? And could you just speak to that a little bit? Because as, as I'm sure you know, often what we see is people are a little too optimistic in their assumptions before the EMR implementation resulting with a budget miss. So just wanted to get a little more detail about that. Absolutely. Um, you know, 
we honestly feel that the impact, and keep in mind, it's only going to be three months into our FY23 fiscal year, um, which will extend into FY24, but we really do feel that the impact will be budget neutral. And I say that because of the efficiencies that we're going to gain by several things. One is we're going to be adopting industry standard workflows with the EMR implementation. We're actually streamlining systems. Right now we have four EMRs that we're operating. We're going to be streamlining three out of the four. And as you can imagine, because of our structure, the FQHC system isn't really talking to the hospital system well. So that's really going to create an efficiency there. And then also, this is a significant one. We're going to be migrating away from manual processes and really shifting to uh, a system driven process across the board. And so we really felt that that would create that budget neutrality for us versus what I've honestly experienced in my past going through a very large EMR implementation where you do anticipate some dips there in the utilization. Yes, yep, absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and in your narrative, you had mentioned that you did not uh, realize all of the full amount of your rate increase from commercial payers uh, last year. And I wonder if it's possible for you to quantify that a little for us, if not now, later, in okay. terms of what that impact was. Yes, I don't remember off of the top of my head, Robin, what we had put forward last year, but we can certainly get that to you. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, in terms of the travelers, uh, a lot of hospitals have been kind of giving us this information in terms of numbers and uh, dollars per hour. So I'm wondering if it's possible for you to kind of translate your information into that kind of format just for comparison purposes so we can see, you know, how things are hitting apples to apples. Sure. So I'll speak to this and what we put in the, the budget versus what we might be seeing currently. So yeah. in the budget, we did include the um, premium portion of that traveler pay for the equivalent of about three travelers and at the rate of about $140 an hour. Since uh -huh. then, honestly, um, the rate has come down to be about more in line at $120 an hour. Um, so there has been a little bit of a variance since we had done the projection, to be honest with you, but that is really what we incorporated into the budget. Okay. And you said three travelers. How many do you have now? Oh, well, during the projection, we had uh, 12 nursing um, travelers and two ancillary travelers. We now have, Dan, I believe it's 19 that we do currently have in-house. We have quite a few, though, for those off the top of my head are in ancillary and the remainder are in our nursing areas. And when I say ancillary, you heard this, it's radiology and lab um, yeah. is really where those are sitting. You know, we really are hoping that we can buy that down with our wage increases and also and Dan might want to jump in. We've been really leveraging our relationships, you know, with some of the area um, educational institutions, and we are going to be having some new grads starting. But Dan, I didn't know if you wanted to jump in on that at all. I actually will uh, see if Joe wants to um, uh, take a swing at that one since it's right um, right in her wheelhouse. You're muted, so Joe. Joe. And I apologize, I can't remember. Was Jill sworn in? Yes, she was. I was. Yes. OK, great. Yes. Thank you. Um, so we do. We have um, between 19 and I think soon to be 21 travelers, a majority of those in the nursing areas, uh, med surge, OR, BC, ED. It's kind of across the whole board. Um, we also have been very frugal in making sure that we are only utilizing travelers to get us to the point that we can continue to keep our beds open. We are not replacing travelers one-to-one -one, um, with our vacancies. Our vacancies far exceed that. We are fairly lucky in that we have some really dedicated, committed folks and a lot of per diem staff that are really working full-time. In the med surge area, I have five per diem staff that are working full time, and without them, that would be five more travelers. So, 
Um, you know, we really are thankful. We started a new grad um, nurse residency program this year, and we've had really great success with that so far. We had a couple more just on this call that I saw a couple more applications come through. So really excited that we can get them in and train them. And of course, it's a matter of using our resources to train them and that sort of thing and stage it in because we can't take them all at once. But working really hard to fill those vacancies, working really hard to give them capstone experiences here so they make a relationship with us, um, really working hard to stabilize our workforce because um, that's not sustainable for sure. Great. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. It's exciting to hear about the uh, the partnership with the the educational institutions and growing your own because that does seem like it's been a very successful strategy around the state for hospitals. So that's yes. great. Um, and I'm almost done. I just had a couple others, which again can be follow up later. Um, in terms of um, so when you're talking about your margin, you were talking about the different pressures because of the structure of your institution. I'm wondering if it's possible to quantify any of those pressures um, to just provide some more finance, some more dollars sort of justification for the margin. If you don't mind, Robin, I can actually speak to it now. And also, Great. I'm I'm fortunate enough to have a very adept director of revenue cycle operations who um, told me that our 22 rate was $823,000, just so that we, we can put that to bed now, I guess. Um, yeah. In terms of our margin, on the face of our financial statements, it appears that the hospital's margin is $6.7 million. Um, and after we take into account the deficit for Robin's Nest, as well as the nursing home and the FQHC, it actually buys that margin down to $900,000 at a rate of one and a half percent. Great. Great, okay, that is, that's my only question. I'm all set, thank you, Jess. Thank you so much. And I just want to acknowledge that somebody has their hand raised um, using the hand raised function named guest, I don't know who you are, but I wanted to say that there, at this point in time, we're just doing board questions and we'll turn to the HCA after that. Um, and then there's an opportunity for uh, public comments. So just wanted to let whoever was waiting in the wings there know that. Okay, uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom Pellin. Well, this is gonna be pretty quick. Um, the uh, My first question was already answered precisely at. 6.7 million down to $900,000. Uh, I do remember a couple of years ago when we were um, at the hospital, there was um, an issue at, uh, with con some some of the these uh, retirement units, you know, and they just weren't moving as fast as people had hoped. Um, and my guess is with the real estate market now, they probably all moved pretty quickly. Um, but uh, if you could talk about that a little bit, because that a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, two years, that was a big deal. I, I mean, they were just, uh, you know, doing what you said happens with margin when you have these other entities that look at the hospital's margin as their margin, too. So, uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, really, in uh, 2021, once um, people started to, to move about again, and uh, as you noted, the real estate market, uh, got quite um, insane. Um, uh, we we were able during 2021 to fill fill it. So we have 49 apartments. Uh, I believe it was in November of 2021. We we filled it and it remains full. And we have um, we um, we have a a program of uh, a ready list, which is what it sounds like. People who are ready to move in and. Um, uh, I believe there's 14, um, 14 people or 14 couples who are um, ready to move in once an apartment comes up. So uh, once an apartment does come up, people are moving in right away. So uh, situation is completely different. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, we were able to move quickly and um, uh, that is um, doing well. Well, that's very good news. Um, it was, it was a, I just remember it was a bit of a struggle back when, and now it's uh, a blessing and a blessing. Um, my next question is, um, 
uh, looking at um, the Medicaid numbers, budget to budget, um, uh, this, I have two questions. Um, uh, it's, it's a drop from $7.2 million to $4.3 million in, in NPR budget to budget. And um, uh, the, uh, a lot of that was related to lower utilization and changes in accounting being the causes. Um, so do, do you have any sense of the proportionality between uh, changes in accounting and utilization? Um, we do, Tom. So the change in accounting, if I remember off the top of my head, not looking at the appendix right, um, was about $1.1 million shift actually from the Medicaid bucket into Medicare. And from a utilization standpoint, trying to think off the top of my head, I think it's around uh, $2.3 million, if I recall, um, on that particular line item for the utilization shift. Okay. Um, and my, my last question is uh, just if you could talk a little bit, and maybe this is for Jill, I don't know, um, but talk a little bit more about um, the uh, implementing, anticipating the hiring of new grads in the next few months. Um, so it, it sounds like uh, the pipeline from the educational institutions into the hospital is is um, is getting developed or is developed. And I'm wondering, A, can you talk about that a little bit more? Um, because just to get a sense of whether you're ahead of other hospitals, every hospital is, is trying to pursue that. But secondly, um, I'm wondering if this is part of the state's workforce development program and that this effort is being done in collaboration with um, with state entities. So, so it's a little bit of both. Um, we've certainly been involved with the state workforce collaborative and um, you know looking at some formal partnerships with VTC where we would actually have um, in fall of 23 have some of our um, staff here become actual clinical instructors and then we would offset that with seats in the nursing programs. We haven't realized that yet. Um, but we have really kind of marketed and gone out to many of the nursing schools. And I think Gifford offers something a little different than other places. I mean, entering healthcare as a graduate nurse in the middle of a pandemic when there is no resources, there's no support, there's no one who can you can look to as a mentor and that sort of thing is, is very scary. And there's a lot of folks that would want to come to a smaller hospital that has more resources and support and understands the workload and has those reassurances. So I do think that we have a little bit of an edge there. Um, we have invested a ton of time with our nurse educator on our residency program and making sure that we're not just orienting them to the job, but like onboarding them into the profession and continuing that um, through for the next full year with these folks. And by doing some preceptor training um, as well, so that we're really making sure that we're not just pairing them with nurses who know how to do the job, but nurses who know how to transition them from um, nursing school to practice, which is a huge leap. And, um, you know, it's really, we're, we're kind of continuing to um, improve our process as we're doing that. Uh, we have also adopted another methodology for the way we're orienting them called TSAM, where we actually are maximizing their clinical experiences by having them partnered with a nurse and having full responsibility with the nurse for the whole assignment, but only doing certain tasks within that. And as they continue to develop that, they would um, gain more. It's, it's an evidence-based practice model that I think is really, it reduces your orientation time by 18%. It, it increases their clinical exposures by 62%. And it's really been very um, positive in its feedback. So I'm not sure if every other facility is using that model, but we've started it. We have seven new grads that we're in the process of kind of moving through. And like I said, I'm getting more all the time. But I do think that they are looking to, to start their practice in an environment that's going to mm -hmm. support them and not eat them up. <laughs> Cause... I, 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 I hear your phone ringing. Um, <laughs> the, I mean, the reason I ask that is it's just kind of a, a thought in the back of my mind that um, travelers are in, to some extent, kind of a one-time event if in, unless the pandemic comes back or something, but it's been a huge 
investment at a short period of time that um, as normal processes um, begin to uh, unfold, um, may be mitigated just over the next couple of years, which happen to be budget years 2003 and 2004. And I'm just trying to get a sense of what we're building in the base of hospitals that uh, may just kind of fall by the wayside over, over the next couple of years. So that's why I asked that question. And with that, um, all I'll say is um, I've known Jen a little bit um, on the board and everywhere she goes, there's these incredible operating margins. And so she, she's got the special sauce and uh, um, don't let her don't let her go, Dan, because, <laughs> you know, when you're looking at six and seven and eight percent margins and I know you've got other draws on that, but um, you're the best margin person there is in, in the hospital business. So thank you for that. And uh, back to Jess. Great. I agree with everything you said, Tom. <laughs> Could I just add one thing to your statement, Tom, that I think was very optimistic about the workforce? Um, I don't think the travelers are a one-time thing. It's projected that the nursing shortage is going to take us through 2030, at least with all the baby boomers that are leaving the profession and joining the actual care population. And so while I think we've gained a little bit of ground here, I do not even begin to think that travelers are over or that we've solved it or anything. So I don't want to rain on your parade, but um, the numbers don't yeah, predict it, that I, quite as I, much. I, I, I fully agree with you that it is a risk. I mean, it maybe it's a risk not worth taking, but you, there are some hospitals out here that have told us they're, they're not like Southwestern. They're not hiring temp uh, um, um, travelers at all. Um, they just they, they basically taken the approach of investing in their in in permanent staff. And I I, I just you know it's uh, I could be totally wrong. I don't I, I know I'm not presenting that as that was what I think. It's just kind of what I'm trying to explore is, sure. and that's why we have these hearing processes. Yep. So thank thanks. you. Okay, great, uh, Member Walsh. Thank you, Jess. And hello, Dan, Jennifer, Jill, and Vic. It's nice to meet you. Um, haven't had the chance in person, but it's nice to see this. Um, this is very short. I wanted to just um, say thank you for submitting uh, a, a, such a clear presentation, clear narrative, um, answering the questions about assumptions within the budget uh, also very clearly. Um, and I also thought it was worth calling out your in-house behavioral support. That's something that um, we haven't heard other places. That seems like um, a, a, a real sign of your commitment to your to your staff. Um, and the community listening tours. Um, that's also not something that um, you know there there are needs assessments, uh, but a listening tour is another level of commitment. And I I think that's worth noting. Um, and so thank you for doing that. And and with that, I'll go back to you, Jess. No further questions. Great. Thank, thank you and welcome to the board. Thank you, sir. Uh, just a couple of clarify, maybe one or two clarifying questions. Um, one was when you talk about your 3.65%, you use the term commercial rate increase and most people talk about a change in charge and I've always asked all the hospitals as I'm sure you know what is the relationship between the change in charge and the commercial rate the effective commercial rate so when you use the term commercial rate increase I guess I'm I'm questioning is that your change in charge or are you giving us the effective commercial rate and if so no, that's okay no go ahead Jen that's great <laughs> I think you know my question so have at it yeah no that is the change in charge but the uh, you know effective commercial rate that we're actually going to be able to recognize is 2.92 percent. Okay. Is there a number that we ask you that you don't know? I'm Just sure there could be one. I'm sure there's a lot up here, but I'm sure. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. No, that's really helpful. Um, and actually, let me just ask, you know, what was interesting about Gifford's uh, choice with respect to how to apply those charges, you know, across inpatient, outpatient, and professional. I noticed for most hospitals, they would apply it to inpatient and outpatient with nothing applied to professional. So seeing the 15% applied to professional and the much lower, you know, applied to inpatient and outpatient, I wanted to ask a little bit about that decision and what that means, really. 
So candidly, when we did that revenue cycle uh, evaluation, a portion of our fee schedules on the professional side of our business are actually currently um, set below the Medicare fee schedule. And so when we evaluated those, we felt that we needed to bring that up as necessary. And so that's why you're seeing that larger percentage there because we are actually getting paid below the Medicare fee schedule. Okay, no, that's helpful. Um, thank you for that. And, you know, my other question was around a little bit around occupancy rates. And, and so thank you for sharing your occupancy rates and your average daily census. I see that it varies between 10 and 12. It, it says in here that you staff for 25, but I'm wondering, do you, is that really what you're staffing for is 25 or that's um, typically, you know, if you're not coming close to 20, you know, in terms of an average daily census, or is your variance so wide that there are days when you're, you know, coming close to 20 and other days when you're at five? I mean, how does that work, your staffing, particularly in these workforce shortage era? Jill, you want to jump in on that? Sure. So the 25 is kind of our all-in number for our med surge area and our birthing center. So um, in our birthing center, we have core staffing around the clock of two RNs. So that is a fixed number that you can't change. Um, same with our ED. We have our fixed staffing to kind of keep things open. On our med surge area, we really, while you might take a snapshot of time and you see a number of 10, you may see us be up at 17 or 18 throughout the day where we're discharging five or six, admitting five or six, and we're turning those patients over on a regular basis. Um, we also have some longer term stay folks who are getting, uh, well, some short term rehab folks who are staying longer than the acute stay, you know, and getting some swing bed time as well, you know, using a lot of resources. So we are staffing our HP unit for a census of 15 to like 18 to give us that flex. But the 25 is our all in number with our birthing center, et cetera. Super helpful. That was great. Thank Thanks. you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Um, let me see if I have other questions. I, the other ones were just requests, actually not so much questions, but um, thank you for the data, you know, that you provided on the specialty weights. Um, you aggregated it by, you know, all specialty, all in one. Really what we're trying to get at is information about different specialties where we can see the, where the bottlenecks are across the state in certain specialty areas. So, um, you know, this may not be possible for you now. I, I recognize that may be a bigger challenge, but my request is really as you move to a new EMR system, if you can, you know, uh, try and incorporate tracking of both re referral lags and visit lags by specialty. We're going to ask this, I assume we're going to ask this question again next year. So um, to the degree, I know you're going to be in transit in terms of an EMR next summer. So that may be a bit of a challenge for you. But if, you know, this is one of those issues where if we don't measure these metrics, we don't know there's a problem. We don't know where the problems are and we can't move to fix them. So that was just the one request. And then the other one was I'm asking every hospital, just if anything changes in the next week or two or since your submission about federal or state payments, relief funds, unexpected increases in Medicaid, Medicare, anything like that, if you could just let us know and, and let in particular Sarah, Sarah's team know. Okay, so I think that's it for me. Um, and I've actually, I, do I, I don't think our finance team has any questions, but I'll just throw it out there. Does our finance team have any questions at this time? I am not hearing any. So at this point, I think what I'm going to do is turn it over to our HCA. Thank you, Chair Holmes. Um, Dan, you, with your comment about putting a dollar in the jar every time you use an acronym, it forced me to frantically rewrite things. And I'm still going to use acronyms, undoubtedly, um, but I'll find your jar. Um, so, you know, I, I do want to echo the kind of laudable efforts you have done to speak with your patients and the community at large. And I think it um, that's not necessarily an easy thing. And the community listening tour, I think, both how it informs your strategic plan and how you put it front and center in your presentation, I think speaks volumes to your organizational culture. Um, I also just wanted to say that it, I, I was very happy 
with to see the connections you made between your cost reduction strategies and your requested charge increase. I think you did a wonderful job outlining how those cost reduction strategies were specifically geared towards uh, reducing your charge request. So you mentioned in the narrative, um, moving from an in-house anesthesiologist model to a contracted services model and how that affects GMC's finances. I'm curious about its impact, if any, on patients and specifically patients um, who may be who are eligible for patient financial assistance or your financial assistance policy, depending on what type of person you're talking. I mean, people use different terminology for it. Sure, I can I can speak to that, Eric. And and really, uh, the the way the contract is actually structured, it's kind of a net neutral type mm -hmm. of relationship between us. Um, so you know, nothing increased in terms of you know our applied percent to charges or anything like that that would change the patient's obligation, um, so to speak. So I think that you know that really kind of levels out in the end, to be honest with you. It's just a change in in the shift of how we're reporting that as, as an expense in terms instead of revenue, I should say. Okay, and I, I, I bring this up really because, um, you know, you may be aware of Act 119, and I think in an early draft of that bill, there was um, some talk and uh, some language about having contractors um, adopt a hospital's uh, patient financial assistance policy that was dropped. Um, and so there are many aspects to the financial assistance policy, but really um, GMC stands out as, I think, at least having read all the PFAs, the, the, FA, the patient financial assistance policies of all the Vermont hospitals, you stand out honestly, as covering contractors um, also under that policy. And I think that bears noting. Thank you. Um, so this is less about GMC, but really as you're, we're thinking about a new EMR, um, I was wondering, were you offered, and this isn't about whether I'm guessing it's unaffordable. Um, were you offered a discounted license to Epic by um, the health UVM Health Network? Dan, if you don't mind, I can I can take that one. Um, the answer to that, honestly, Eric, is no one. But I can tell you, you know, some inherent. You know, I happen to come from the larger health system here in Vermont, um, and I, you know, want to make a couple. Of you know, correlations to that here. So um, the way EPIC was structured under the network would actually require a considerable amount of support by the UVM HN team to be involved in managing things um, such as the charge master, how AR actually functions, the way uh, supplies function, just to name a few things. It was really set up to be interrelated within the network, which is great, um, okay. obviously, for them. But in terms of trying to bring other organizations onto that platform, it would pose some challenges, I would say. And so the other thing I did just want to mention, too, just from a broader perspective for the smaller hospitals that you have here in Vermont, is it's not just, and you mentioned the cost, because everybody says that about Epic, of course, but it's not just the licensing cost with Epic. I'm gonna be very frank that there are numerous, um, what is referred to as Epic dependencies that require the purchase of, of quite a few Cadillac platforms. And those are very costly and they can't be shared among the organizations. And that's, you know, they use Workday for payroll. That's a Cadillac platform. Um, Cornerstone for their education platform. They use ServiceNow for their IT service ticket um, platform. So I, I can go on. But those dependencies really do come at a really high cost, especially for the smaller organizations. So I just I just thought I'd mention if that was helpful. That That is super helpful. And I, you know, I, I, 
obviously Epic would cause lots of problems for uh, small hospitals and people have different opinions about the ROI on Epic. Um, and I won't go into my personal opinions here. Um, so I'm curious with implementing this new EMR, is it what, what value do you think it's gonna have for patient care and what's the kind of return on investment are you hoping so, it will have? So I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, you know, some of our goals for patient care. Um, I tried to specifically uh, note in my, in my comments um, what we think it's going to do for us around population health. Um, you know, we, uh, I, I think to the, to the question before about wait times and our ability to be able to split out our wait times specifically by specialty, we have very little ability right now to be able to um, to get data out of our systems in a way that um, assist us with with decision making, uh, whether that's financial, whether that is statistical, but definitely uh, as it relates to being able to design particular programs and outreach and disease management um, interactions with patients. We're limited in being able to do that right now with our current system. So by going to the platform we're going to, it's going to uh, greatly um, up our capabilities there. Uh, and I do think that that is going to directly benefit patients. Um, I think it's going to directly benefit our employees as well, because these are activities that they're chomping at the bit to be able to do. And there's a restraint there because of our uh, of our systems. There's a um, uh, also a, a, I'd say a corollary uh, simple benefit that our patients are going to um, have as well. Jen noted we have uh, four um, four electronic health records across our system. We have two patient portals as well. If you come to the hospital proper, uh, there's one patient portal. If you go to our practices, there's a second patient portal. Um, that is neither. Um, uh, efficient, nor is it overall helpful at times for for our patients. Um, it's a struggle for me when I'm trying to figure out uh, what I should be accessing as well. So that's going to be a big um, improvement as well. So those are just two specific areas that we probably could um, talk for hours about this, um, but um, but it's definitely going to have an impact positive impact uh, for our patient population and for our communities in regard to our community health activities. I hope and, it goes. Um, oh, sorry, Eric. I was just going to comment on on two other things, if, if you don't mind. One is, you know, now we're going to have one patient record also, so that's certainly going to be a help for our patients. And with the new EMR, one of the things that we really took seriously and into consideration um, especially around our financial assistance and what we can do for patients is it's going to allow us to really expand upon our pre-registration process so that we're going to be able to put our patient advocates in contact with the patients prior to them coming to the visit so that they're not so potentially stressed with, you know, having those bills when they come into a healthcare organization. So we're really adopting that practice when we roll out the new EMR as well. So I did just want to mention those two things. No, that would be great. And I was just going to say I was wish you the best with the implementation process. I know it can be rather rocky at times. So um, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, uh, Charlie, if he's on. I am here. Hi, so this is Charles Becker, a new staff attorney with the HCA, but it looked like, uh, Jill, you had your hand up. <clears throat> um, yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, with our four systems now, they are all these standalone systems where nothing flows forward for the patient. So when we're trying to embed evidence-based best practice and really looking at outcomes, our providers are having to re-enter data several times and our patients really aren't kind of you know, appreciating that that um, impact of what a truly integrated system could do. I think I really think our system is going to definitely have direct impact on our patient outcomes. The patient portal, um, we didn't even talk about that, but their access to their own information in a seamless way, and you know, um, just having that all flow forward is going to have a huge impact on them and the providers. Now spend, you know, three times the time trying to do something very simple. 
and they could be spending that sitting down and having great conversations with patients. So it's it's huge for us. We're so excited about it. Unlike maybe some other places who don't want the change, we're ready for it. We need it. So perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I just had one question. I was curious. Uh, and I should just introduce myself again. I'm I'm Charles Becker, a new staff attorney with uh, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. I haven't met any of you all before, so nice to meet you. Um, I was just interested in hearing a little bit more about a couple of the public health initiatives that you mentioned, particularly as they relate to access to care. So I'm just down the road from you in Stockbridge, right? So I know that we're in uh, uh, one of the more rural areas of a, of a very rural state and that the population here skews older and it's hard for some of our neighbors to get out and drive. The, the roads are rough even in good weather. Um, Maybe some people can't even afford a vehicle. So I'm just curious to hear about the the, the home visits program. Um, how many people are are you serving with that program? Who is it geared toward? What types of visits are, we, are you able to make with that program? How much does it cost? <laughs> and then also, I was curious about the, the rides to wellness program mentioned in the narrative. Um, I tried to do a little bit of research about that one ahead of time, and I could only find a reference to something from the Agency of Transportation, a pilot program in Springfield in 2018. I was just wondering, is that the same program? Is it up and running in Gil Gifford? How does it function? Is it volunteer based? What can I sign up? <laughs> Great. Well, uh, Charles, welcome. And um, uh, just state that if uh, you're driving in uh, Stockbridge on 107 and Jen comes behind you, just let her go by. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I'll, I'll talk about the first one. And um, uh, Rebecca O'Berry, uh, who was sworn in as our vice president of operations, I'm going to um, uh, hopefully tag team her to talk about the uh, the rides to wellness uh, program but the, uh, the the home visit program is uh, it's still a pilot uh, project if you will um, and uh, our chief medical officer uh, dr. Josh white uh, has been very active in pursuing this unfortunately he was sick today so um, that he could tell you all about it I can tell you some about it and Charles will be happy to um, if you want to talk more about it in the future, but um, this is a program. It's it's similar to uh, to a um, um, to a para professional program. A para, um, yeah, uh, I just totally lost the word. But um, um, uh, with with EMT programs, para, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so pairing with um, with EMT programs. Uh, this started over in Chelsea with their ambulance service. Um, and um, they actually had started themselves, and then we got involved because we have a primary care practice in Chelsea, um, and there's another nonprofit board that had provided some funding, uh, basically grant funding to the ambulance service in Chelsea so that they could go out and do home visits, basically wellness checks um, for people who are homebound or um, really trying to target people that the ambulance service had been called out to a lot. Um, and the logic being that if we engaged with them proactively and the ambulance service went out and just did a check-in visit, uh, looked at this, their, their home surroundings to see uh, are there fall risks, um, are they, um, do they understand what medications they have, and uh, are they taking them correctly? So having conversations about that. Um, you know, taking a look around, do they have food? Um, you know, is the heat turned off? Do they have electricity? All these kind of things. And making that linkage back to the primary care practice. Um, and so if they're seeing things that really they think some interaction is needed, and it might not be an interaction by the primary care practice, but between that connection, we then can, um, we can connect with some of the organizations and some of the people who may be able to help them with getting food. And um, uh, if you'll indulge me, I, I, I would like to tell you some more about some of the food security programs that we're doing, but there's a lot of resources that we then can pair up with. And the at the end of the day, we're trying to keep people from calling the ambulance for a ride uh, to the emergency department uh, that when that could be avoided. Um, and uh, trying to help people avoid uh, costly healthcare interventions where it is avoidable. We've now, um, so again, that was initially funded uh, through a nonprofit in Chelsea with that ambulance service. 
Um, we at Gifford have put our own skin in the game and we're um, providing grant funding to um, the ambulance services, uh, the South Royalton and also uh, White River Valley Ambulance, um, which White River Valley would, would serve your area, um, Charles. Um, so uh, we're doing it with them as well. And again, it still is somewhat of a pilot project um, in large part because the ambulance services are um, struggling with staffing as well. Um, but indications are that it's going that it's going well. I think the numbers we have at this point, the the statistics are um, probably too small to make um, uh, too many um, uh, uh, to draw too many conclusions on. But we know anecdotally it's helping people, and we've gotten information from ambulance services that if they're not able to make one of these visits to one to someone who they interact with frequently, typically that the, um, the the chance is far greater that they're going to call and want to ride to the emergency department. Um, so and that's that's what we're uh, trying to avoid. Um, uh, so I just note that we do have a number of um, food security programs as well, and um, I don't want to prolong with all that, but I've got I've got a whole page. But um, if that is a well, question. That's I fantastic. It's really neighbors yeah. looking after neighbors. And uh, at least with the home visits program, it sounds like it's very uh, low cost and maybe even reduces an overall cost of the healthcare system. So that's fantastic. I hope it um, is able to be long lasting. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, is there someone that's able to speak to rides to wellness? <clears throat> Rebecca, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi, thanks for the question. Um, the Rise to Wellness program is uh, has been a grant funded initiative through the state um, that we have participated with uh, Tri-Valley Transit, which we call Stagecoach in our area. It's Tri-Valley Transit. I will always call it Stagecoach. That's just what's going to happen. And, you know, so we have um, an, an agreement with them that um, if we have a patient who needs a ride, um, sometimes we can work it out with Tri-Valley Transit that they pick it up. Um, other times we have to coordinate with maybe the patient's friend or a neighbor or someone who can get them here. And then we basically through invoicing pay that person a certain fee to get the person to get the patient here to, you know, an x-ray appointment or even to pick up uh, prescriptions at the pharmacy, things like that. We also tried to set up with business Uber with Uber for health, um, which actually does exist. And wow. um, we, <laughs> yeah, we've got we've got it all set up. We just need some Uber drivers in our towns. Um, so we've tried to do it a couple of times online to make fake rides for us back and forth to different places to just see if we can get an Uber. And if you schedule it ahead of time, sort of like if I have an appointment next Tuesday, you can actually get it to work. If not, you know, if it's a same day thing, an, an urgent care visit or something, it, it, we just don't have people um, in Uber in our area yet. So. Um, it's worked really well. Um, I don't know, the funding was a sort of a, a, a pilot program. I think that's what you were referring to earlier. It didn't mm. really take off so much in the Springfield area, and so they expanded it. And that's how we became part of it. Um, so that's that's the program. And, and I, I, like Dan, would be happy to talk about food security. It's my passion. <laughs> Absolutely, well, very nice, thank you. Thank you. And Chair Holmes, I didn't have any more questions. <clears throat> So I think that's it for the HCA. OK, great. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, I would be happy to open it up for any public comment. So if anybody wants to make a comment about this budget, the Gifford budget, please just use the raise your hand function on Teams and I will see you. OK, at this point, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, if there's anybody on the phone that wants to speak, you can also do so by just unmuting yourself and speaking at this moment. Okay. Well, I'm not hearing any any public comment at this moment in time. So just want to thank you to the Gifford team. You know, we appreciate your insights into your budget this year. And thank you for sharing some of the really innovative initiatives that you're taking uh, with your community. It's really impressive and inspiring. Um, I think there may have been a couple of follow-ups. If there were, now I can't remember all the 
budget hearings are going in my head, but if they're already, Sarah and team will follow up with you. But actually, I think, Jen, you had answers to everything because you have numbers off the top of your head and lists and <laughs> do all your homework. So I don't <laughs> think you did. Uh, at this point, this is the end of our day five. We will have closing ceremonies on Friday. So <laughs> when we will be hearing from Copley and Northeastern starting at 8.30 in the morning, that'll end our hospital budget uh, cycle for this year prior to our deliberations. So with, at this point, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right, I'm going to take that from Tom Pelham as a motion and Tom Walsh as a second. All those in favor, they say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Sounds like it's a unanimous decision to go have a margarita. So <laughs> I'm getting a little. <laughs> thank you all. Yeah, thank you thank very you. much, Gifford. Appreciate it. Thank Everybody you. Have a beer. Thank See you. Ya. Thank you.